This is uh, episode two of The Listening Space, where we get a chance to listen to the music uh, and talk about some of the values that we're, that we're, we're hearing in the music and, and try to point to some things and encourage young musicians to, to try out some of these things when they're on their own bandstands and, and practice rooms. Um, so next, I think we'll, we'll shine the light on the bass and, and, and talk to Brother Ruben Rogers about mm -hmm. some things. He, he gave me two tracks to choose to, oh, well, to, to play. So we'll start with the well, first of your two. From, but <laughs> no, no, we'll play them both. We'll get to them both. Oh, yeah? um, the first is a Joe Henderson record mm -hmm. uh, entitled Lush Life. And let's see, I have more information like the year. 1992. That's a, a 92 record. Um, Went Marsalis, Stephen Scott on piano, Christian McBride on bass, Gregory Hutchinson on drums. And you chose the track, Johnny Come Lately. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get a, a taste of it and then talk to, you, talk to you about why you chose it. Here we go, Johnny Come Lately. Stephen Scott for fading it out on his. So. <laughs> no no well, I think it's it's safe to say that the bass had something to do with your decision on that track. Some, some. Um, but some. I, while watching Ruben listen, I also noticed that he knew where Stephen Scott's <laughs> comp and chords would happen yeah. and stuff too. So clearly, a track that you've soaked up a lot of the nuances of. Well, Talk to us um, about it. Well, I, trust me, there was a lot of tracks that I thought about, mm. but I'm. I picked this track for the first two reasons. It's, it's nostalgic for me. Uh, I moved from the Virgin Islands to the States in 1992. 
that's the year this record came out. So uh, I had soaked up some music before, but this was like the, the you know, I mean, this is a young lion kind of record with a master, you know, you know, I mean, Winton's kind of in the middle there. So I remember getting this record, and this is kind of my introduction to kind of a little more modern, modern, like of that day, I should say, you know. Um, and I didn't know any of these people. I didn't really know. I knew who Joe Henderson was. I kind of knew who Whitney. I didn't know anyone else, uh, at least their names. Um, and I didn't. I wasn't even playing the upright bass yet. I was playing electric bass, right? Yeah, so that right. year, I bought. I got a, a upright bass. That's right. And I came. Um, I think it, it, the the values. Hearing this kind of record. Her, hearing a lot of other recordings before. That same urgency mm. in the beat in the time, in the harmony, mm. really, I gravitated towards that a lot, you know? Um, and I feel, it's nostalgic, but I think a record like this, not just this song, but this, the, the whole re recording, I think, is timeless, you know, especially for that time. Um, I was a huge fan of Joe Henderson's before that, uh, so this kind of was like the, the, you know, the next step, it was like the next step to, okay, my listening and open up myself to all that. Not knowing that actually almost all these people I end up having a relationship within like a five or six years. Hmm. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. Greg Hutchison is probably the, the drummer I've played with the most yep. in my life, you know? It, you know, Chris McBride is playing bass on here, and, you know, we became friends to playing with Marcellus's band, you know, Steven Scott, we played with Warhol Girls Band for a little bit. I met Joe Hand, I never got to play with him, but I got to be around him. So I think this is was a nostalgic record for me of just a lot of different reasons. But the main thing is is the whole record. I think it's timeless and that 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 track I picked out just because the feeling of it, mm. you know, really kinda embodies what I think I don't know, what what I what drew me to this music. Yeah. You know? Not, yeah. not, not even just a swing or, or the nuances and the feeling of it. That's, you know, that's yeah. why I picked this track, you know? Yeah, I think we, we all probably can comment on, yeah. on that beat, on that feel. I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. consistent with, with what we've been talking about in the previous episode now. Um, and yet, this is 1992. That, that previous track was 1997. Mm -hmm. And I think if you were to listen to them again back, back to back, you can notice some evolution in that. Yeah. And, and I'd, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that, having heard that progression of, of, of the way that the beat feels, you know. Um, but, but even just, just regardless of that, tr feeling wise, from, from what you just heard, what, what are some, some thoughts and, and, and feels on that? Well, the first thought that came to mind was kind of relates to wh how we were speaking earlier of when you hear someone in person for the first time or you go on stage with them. So the first time I played with Joe Henderson, the first thing that popped into my mind was, wow, he gets all that intensity and all that urgency, but his sound isn't real big the way you, ex mm -hmm. you know, he, but, he, but it was still, it's like someone who could speak to you in a whisper and have the same intensity as somebody who's yelling at you. <laughs> You know what I mean? That's how. That's what I first noticed about Joe Henderson. Yeah. And he could do all of that and make you feel all of that stuff without having to blow the house down. There you go. Sound wise, you know, you know decibel wise. There I guess. You, go. you know what I mean? Yeah. Quality instead of quantity. You dig? I, and it, it, what's funny is it like, so for a, a hungry young musician who's asking themselves, how do I express that on my horn? How do I get the intensity without raising the dynamic or, or playing insensitively loud or, you know, re retaining the sound but, but keeping the intensity. Um, do, you have a, do you have an idea of how to even, uh, it's one of those, I don't know. It's a, it's a mystery, right? I it got a little a idea. You got an idea? It may not be uh, the way, but I find that if you teach a student to make a statement first. Hmm. So instead of saying, oh, like, you know how you start off, are we going to play a blues or something? If you had your sax right here, just this whole room, what would you say? So if you take away the parameters of the, the swing, everything, and they just get to voice, you kind of learn who they are. Mm. Almost like if, and this, I would see what you mean about the 92 to 97, the, the drums start becoming a little bit more liberated. Mm. But I came up on that warm daddy alto, mm. where you had to kind of sit in the pocket a certain way where your shoulders go, mm. and you really start to see if you just, 
you know, if I came up here, boom, 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 people right away would be like, oh. Hmm. And if you could find a way to put those kind of statements within your solo, into, and then you get so good at that, everything you play becomes that statement. That's how I learned to be more myself. Mm. I was studying with uh, Steve Wilson and Bruce Williams, and they were like, you have a great idea, but you're not able to express yourself. And I, I found that if I started making clear statements that mattered, and then started worrying about the changes and flowing through and practice that separately, you're still able to get that urgency because everything you say has the da ba da ah ah. Mm. So if you pick a note, it really has the the warmness and the vibrato you put. I don't know if that's you know the yeah. best way, but it's helped me. I, I can dig it. I, I definitely realize that this is the answer to this isn't something technical, right? Yeah. We're not talking about theory or, or you know, thinking about scales and arpeggios and chords here. We're talking about that thing that goes behind the note, right? The feeling of it, the, your, the, the conviction of your spirit and your message yeah. that you're putting into the note. Like um, almost if you could sing the solo, like you make, make the students sing the solo and they have to play with the same urgency if they had the confidence if they had their sax. And then if you can rhythmic fall in that pocket and get a swag with your rhythm. Yeah. Well, then you start to get more confident in the sax and you're already like, okay. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. You're like, okay, I got a little. <laughs> Dig. And I feel like now students, they really get to that because they can hear it in the hip hop. Mm. They can hear the rhythm in it. They can hear like how somebody's flowing. Mm. And if you, if you try to find a way to put it together for them, it comes out a lot better. <laughs> and to, to be able to express that is a commitment to that, to not think that you can just press the right keys and make it happen, that if you want to make somebody else dance, you have to be dancing on the inside. If you want to make somebody else feel the Holy Ghost, you better be feeling the Holy You know, you really got to... <laughs> You yeah. gotta go in. That Charlie Rouse sax, you know, you know? With Monk. When they they always sound like he's not doing a lot, but it always feels rhythmically jolly and and, and super like shouty. <laughs> yeah, me. I mean, so many of these recordings and and watching cats play live, you can actually hear the grunts and groans coming from the like something inside of you needs to be going. Ah, 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 I have something in to get out when you play. So I, yeah. there maybe. Yeah, thinking maybe, about so. that, and, and I mean, it's the, the eternal question mark on the journey of trying to figure out this music and make sense of it for yourself. Um, but but I, I, would, I would say maybe that's, that's a value that we could get to from, from Joe Henderson and, and from yeah. this track, for sure. Well, um, you, know, you know, I think there's an urgency. I, I tend to try to find the, the continuum that runs from the very beginning of the music all the way to the present day. And that urgency, to me, I hear it in Louis Armstrong. I hear it in Sidney Bechet. Mm -hmm. I hear mm. it's it's there. Mm. Johnny Dodds. I mean, it it goes all the way back. Mm. And it it maybe the the um, the modernness of the harmonies changes or the grooves evolve or whatever. But that thing, this thing that we're talking about, the urgency, it was there from the beginning. Yeah. No mm. Maybe it's like the expression of pain and joy. Mm. Like, so the pain is there and you feel that like, oh my God, but then you feel the joy yeah. of having lived through that and, and almost like persevering and conquering. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I wonder if that's just part of the, the roots of the music, mm -hmm. you know, I, what it means to keep going. I think, it's, I think that's, that's a safe defining characteristic of all of this is that the source of all this is the blues. We are Jealous. downstream from the blues yeah. and I don't think there's a better mm -hmm. definition or characterization of the blues than that, you know, an honest expression testifying of your joys and your sorrows uh, and, and sort of the, the catharsis yeah. that you get from doing that. Um, so Ruben, the, you know, choosing this track made me think, okay, Christian McBride, mm -hmm. huge in, in, in this track, in this sound, um, and that urgency that you, you speak of, that sort of urgency to drive the beat forward um, made me think, it was probably appropriate, appropriate to point to one of his, of course, predecessors and, and great influences, naturally the great Ray Brown, um, as, mm -hmm. as maybe we can check out Ray's beat and, and think about what we just heard on Johnny Come Lately, think about that sound of Christian and how it's directly linked, how it's directly downstream from, from Ray, um, but also in how it's, it's very different and they're both unique. Um, so I thought maybe a good track to play would be an Oscar Peterson record called Affinity, the art 
the jazz soul of Oscar Peterson, um, and this is a track called Liza. Let's see if you if you dig on this. Hard not to play that whole track. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what they were playing in three, but what what, I, what, what was going on there? <laughs> unfortunately, we can't ask them. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're playing in three for some bars and maybe four on some bars. It, sounds it, it like, seems like right. Yeah, that sounds like over okay. To three and a, yeah, yeah. Wow. 
That yeah. was seamless. Kind of hip, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. talk about a working band. Really, though. right? Really, working trio. Whoa, they they got it. Oof, they yeah. made that sound like it was nothing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what, uh, talk to me about Ray Brown and his beat and oh, what you man. what you're hearing in that. Well, you talk about the Godfather of, of, of <laughs> you know what else? But I mean, he's right there. Yeah, yeah what you just heard. Yeah. Um, I was fortunate to know him too. I mean, as as all, both of you do. I don't know if you know him, but I mean, what you hear is what you get. He was warm embracing, you know, uh, I mean, he, and you know, him and Sam Jones, I always remember this, they were working towards seems seemingly perfection till the day they died, you know? They were consummate just, you know, I mean, I remember being on the road and hearing him, I'd be a few doors down <laughs> on the road, and he'd be practicing, you know, like every day. Every day, I remember Victoria, I always remember this, I took a lesson from him. Hmm. And uh, we, we finished the lesson, and he said, all right, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll see you a little later. And leaving the room, and he, he picked up the bass, and he started practicing, and he didn't know this, but I, I stood out there outside his room, and he would, for another hour, he was just there practicing, practicing, and I, I come to know that that was his thing you know he was always striving for that excellence mm. and uh you know but yeah i mean he was you know, uh, the most original one of the most original sounds i mm. think on the instrument you know his commitment to the beat mm. his commitment to to both the sound and the beat and the feeling of you know was so original i mean mm. you know yeah i always say you gonna, don't 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 sound like a broke a broke Ray Brown. No one likes that. You know, mm, just mm. try to get what you what you can from that because you will never be him. Mm, you know? mm, mm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know? I, there are a few words that you said in there that I that I really appreciate. First, I mean, the sound, right? How important that sound mm-hmm. is. But you described it as warm, yes. which I think is when when we line it up next to the track we heard earlier. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's there's a difference in temperature somehow. It feels, mm-hmm. you know, obviously the the sound that. Christian McBride gets out of the bass is beautiful mm. and could also be described as warm. Yeah. But if you put them back to back, there's a, a mm. kind of fuzziness, a, a, a warmth, even even though there's that same mm. urgency and drive in the beat. I mean, mm. it, it, he's the mm. engine that mm. they are sitting on. No doubt. Um, and, and yet there's there's a warmth to a sound, which yeah. I find really, really fascinating. Um, hungry young students sound, the importance mm. of of, of, of the craft of the instrument itself, of mm-hmm. producing a good sound out of the bass. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we all got these responsibilities of just taking care of business. Like, mm-hmm. you, you don't get to sound like Ray Brown by not practicing mm-hmm. all the time, you know? <laughs> um, so th- you those, are, those are good values. No doubt. Um, no doubt. Maestro Nash, what, what, what are you hearing? What are you thinking? Wow, uh, I, I loved playing with Ray Brown. Every, I relished every opportunity to play with him or to just talk with him. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, of course, among my favorite bass players to play with are, you know, influenced us and quite a bit by him. Your dad mm-hmm. and Christian, of course, are people who I, when I know I'm going to be playing with them, a smile comes on my face like weeks before the, <laughs> the gig, right. looking forward to that moment when we're going to be able to be on stage and have that, that feeling. But Ray um, is very special in a lot of our lives and special in my life as well. And a, a quick, really quick story, because I know you're focused on that, on yeah, Ruben, but cool. he, um, when the great Jeff Hamilton was leaving Ray's trio, and he asked me to, if I would join the trio, and this, I don't know if I've told this story publicly or not, but um, <laughs> I declined because at the time I was playing with Tommy Flanagan's trio, and I was still learning a lot. Tommy became like a father to me in a way, but also in the mix, was the fact that I had two really young children at the time, and I was on the road a lot already, and Ray was always on the road, mm. like 300 and some days yeah. a year, and I was Seriously. like, man, mm. I'll be, I'm gone from home now, it's gonna be really, so uh, those kind of, we get those opportunities as musicians, we have to pick and choose a lot of times what we wanna do, but Ray gave me his blessing, he was, and I recommended, I said, well, I can recommend a young drummer to you, he's playing with Roy Hargrove now, but I'll call him and ask him if he's, you know, Ray, and that's when I called Greg Hutchinson, and I said, "Are you? Uh, would you be interested in playing with Ray Brown?" And wow. I connected those two guys. Oh, 
man. Yeah. The, uh, Actually, master, Hutch, master drummer Hutch and did agent. did tell me that story. <laughs> yeah, he did. So, yeah. <laughs> wow, wow. Master drummer, agent, you get it all. You do it all. <laughs> um, Lakeisha, you got thoughts on, on that track? Just anything that stands no, out? No, I'll just take the wisdom of the people that play with Ray Brown. Right, seriously. <laughs> we seriously. love you, Ray Brown. Right? <laughs> yeah, that, that's a real special one. Ruben, you also pointed us to another track. Um, from another bass legend whose expression and character and voice on the instrument, um, I, I suppose you could say is maybe coming from a different place mm -hmm. than, than Ray mm -hmm. uh, and Christian, uh, the great Charlie Hayden. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is from Charlie's beautiful record called Nocturne uh, with the great Gonzalo Rubalcaba. Um, you chose the second track. We, we joked about this yesterday because <laughs> the first track is so good but there's too long of a piano intro, he said. <laughs> so we can't have that. So we're going with the second track from Nocturne, uh, entitled Noche de Ronda from Nocturne by Charlie Hayden. Let's listen to this. Sexy. The, the, the color in the room just shifted, right? That's, yeah. What a beautiful track. Thank I you. I mean, I think for me, I mean, it's just that's, that's the way I see music in many colors, you know? Mm. Uh, I've been really fortunate to play a lot of different contexts. That's how I hear music, you know, in different ways. If I had to go back to the bass, 
Charlie plays half notes almost the whole time. Yeah. Big, beautiful, broad notes for everyone to, to sit on. It's his record, his project. Bass is out front in his mix, but I love it, right? But just the simplicity of it is like, he was so masterful at that period in any context he, he played in. You know, in his solos, the beautiful melodies, and he brought that. And uh, I keep on going to that when, when Gonzalo Bacaba comes in, the contrast between him and Pat Metheny, you know, he's, Pat Metheny's like, ah, and then he's like, ah, okay. <laughs> it's just simplicity, just his sound and his touch. That makes the whole, the whole, you know, track for me usually when I hear that. And that's through the whole recording, I feel, between him and Joe Lovano and, and Dabi Chan Sanchez. They, they, they bring this, this, mm, mm. this thing that really speaks to me, that same urgency in a different kind of way, but that like, you know what? This is what the song needs also. You yeah. know, Gonzalo's like, this is what, this, this, this melody needs this right here. After all that, mm, making those, those beautiful choices in the music, uh, I think is what separates a lot of a lot of you know, that musician to that musician to that musician. So that, that you know, I love this whole recording. This whole recording is pretty much in that thing. Yeah. What's funny? It won a Latin Grammy. Right. That's right. <laughs> that That's year, right. which is it. weird, but <laughs> all, they're all weird. Yeah. <laughs> they probably Wind thought it was a bachata. Uh, yeah. They yeah. probably that kum 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 kum. Yeah. Them. They were like, okay, yeah. that's enough. Uh, they decided <laughs> colors could compete. That's weird. I don't know. That. Um, no, I, I think that's a, a beautiful mm -hmm. point and sentiment that that clarity, that simplicity, uh, and and how actually masterful that is. That that it, it, you know you you can't just play a whole lot of notes and press the right stuff and impress you know Maestro Hayden. You you, you know it's it's all about in, intentionality, really mm -hmm. simplicity. Uh, I think that record also and Gonzalo's time with Charlie Hayden was um, a real. Uh, blossoming in a different way. It's like, it, you know, you hear Gonzalo pre Charlie Hayden, and you hear him afterwards, and it, it, it's like it, it opened up an, a new, a whole other deep well mm -hmm. of expression in in that sort of simplicity. Like Gonzalo can play absolute fire and a million notes as he's as he has done, you know. Mm -hmm. Then with with Charlie, it was just the right note, just just the perfect voicing, the the, the perfect touch, you know. And, and and now he's he's a master of, of, of all of them. It puts together to puts them together so masterfully. Um, but but I, I I love this record for for all those reasons too. Besides just the color that it it, it puts in the room, um, it's such a, a great example of of a mastery in simplicity. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Any any thoughts? The only thing I'll say was it was beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, you know, I heard Charlie Hayden lots of times in mm -hmm. different contexts. I never got to. We never played together. We were on lots of festivals together in different situations like that. But I heard him often, and it was always that same warmth mm -hmm. of sound and commitment to what was going on in that moment. Yeah, yeah. take that, Lakeisha. Any thoughts? Any any. Just Thumbs up over here. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> I think they said it all. Yeah, we're we're all taken taken by that beauty. Well, thank you, Ruben, for those uh, wonderful suggestions.